We're going to get into that message this morning. And I'm excited to bring this message on breaking strongholds. That's why it's so important for you to follow along with me this morning. I will promise you at the end of the service, there's going to be a great opportunity for you to participate. And how are you going to participate? You're going to participate by how the Lord is speaking to your heart this morning. So please be in tune with the message that the Lord has for you today. Uh, Will, are you still over there? How you doing, buddy? I promised you I'd take those off, didn't I? Come on over here. Let me get those off of you. I have my key that I carried for a long time. It used to have a Harley logo on the front of it. I don't know why Harley Davidson put out a handcuff key, but anyway, they did. Uh, uh, you know, it's kind of interesting. You know, I thought about that, and, uh, it, it, you know, it would have been terrible if you'd have had to go to the restroom with them things on, wouldn't it? It had been bad. Yeah. Yeah, when you're, when you're in chains, when, when it just keeps and restricts you from being and doing the things that you would have. Listen, I'm going to take those off of you, and then I'll just ask you a couple of questions, all right? For those that are tuned in with the cinema, they have already had their opening service. They're going, why is Will handcuffed in church? He disobeyed in church. That's all I can say. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, Will, I'm going to take those off of you, all right? I didn't double lock those, so that's a good thing. Uh, Will, real quickly, is this on, guys? One, two. Will, quick question for you. How, how did that feel? You've never... You've never had those on before. Huh? Okay, good, good. Just want to make sure. <laughs> You've never had those on before. That was my question. Just want to make sure mom and dad are here. You've never had those on before, have you? Correct. Nope. How did it feel to be restricted in your movement? Uh, you feel kind of helpless and worthless, and, you know, if someone needed you or you couldn't, I mean, you're restricted. You're chained by um, the transgressions and afflictions that's, that are upon you. Yeah. Would you like to wear these the rest of the day? Not particularly, no. <laughs> Thank you, buddy. Thank you, Will. By the way, uh, I'm excited. hope Will doesn't mind me saying this. He's one of our young men, and uh, he, uh, I'm going to meet with him this week. He's gonna, he's, we're going to pray about him doing a, an adult Bible study. I think that's awesome. Wouldn't that be great? Yeah, so that's exciting. You know, a young man that says, hey, I'm ready to, I'm ready to teach a, a Bible class, and I think that's exciting. Wasn't it great to see little Addie up here praying, too? So many folks have got a stronghold about praying in public, and here it is, a little one that's up here praying. Isn't that just awesome? Well, let's get into, uh, let's get into the message this morning. Before we do that, though, I want to have a word of prayer because I just I believe the Holy Spirit is moving in the house this morning and, and speaking to hearts and minds, and I just want us to be in tune with what the Lord would have for us this morning, whether you're listening to us online, watching at the cinema, right here uh, in this house. Let's go to him in prayer. Father, you are the chain breaker. There is no stronghold in our life that you cannot defeat. We can be victorious in you. And Father, my prayer is this morning for those that are listening to the sound of my voice. May they listen to the words that you have for me to speak this morning. As we dive into the word of God, Lord, may they listen to the word of God and how it speaks to their mind and to their heart. Each and every one of us, Lord, have a stronghold. Each and every one of us have this little box, maybe one, maybe several, that we've held on to. Some may not even know about it. Some may not see it. It's things maybe in our private life, or maybe others, Lord, see it and want to make us aware of it. In fact, Lord, they may even judge or condemn us because of something that's going on in our life rather than love and encourage us in Christ. So, Father, my prayer is this morning that as the power of the Holy Spirit moves among us, as it speaks to us, as it tenderizes our heart and opens up our mind, may we be in tune to exactly what it is, Lord, that you would have us change. And to realize, Lord, we can be victorious in and through Jesus Christ. So, Father, that's what I ask this morning. May you work with your people. For those, Lord, that may be in this house or listening online and They've never accepted Christ as their Savior. The greatest chain that could ever be broken is the chain of sin. And Father, that chain was broken when Jesus was nailed on a cross and shed his precious blood for me and for them. So Father, may they not leave this place. May they not tune out without making Jesus Christ their chain breaker of sin, their Lord and their Savior. So we thank you, Lord, for what you're going to do. We're going to go ahead and claim the victory in all of this this morning. In Jesus' name, all God's people said, 
Amen. Again, the title of the message is Break the Strongholds. Now, you're, you're probably interested as to where this may be going. And there's several different directions this message could take this morning. I'm not quite sure. I've, I've studied on this all week. In fact, it, it's something that came uh, as of this last, this past Sunday night. You know, last week I told you it was kind of an interesting week. I had one of those pity party weeks, you know. And then the Lord brought me to a moment on Saturday night. We had a wonderful time of fellowship and outreach last Saturday. We had a wonderful service in the house last Sunday. Sunday night, I had the opportunity to have dinner, and 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 uh, while I was by myself, and I met this young man, and it was kind of interesting the conversation that we had, and and he felt like he was no good. He felt like all he'd ever do in his life was in construction work. He only had an eighth grade education, and he says, "This is it for me. Life doesn't get any better." And he began to tell me about all the struggles in his life that he was going through, and uh, how we even met is I was wearing one of my Harley shirts. I'd rode up on the bike. He saw the bike outside. He figured I'm, the guy with a Harley shirt on must be him. And then as we got to talking about the bike, and then we got into other things, he looked at me and says, well, you just don't look like a preacher. And I said, that's awesome. I don't want to look like one. I want to look like one that loves you and cares about you. So I had the opportunity as he was telling me his story, I got to tell him my story. I got to share the gospel with him. Now, here's what I would love to tell you. I would love to tell you that before we parted, he accepted Christ, but he didn't. But one of the things he did get and I offered it to him. I offered him my phone number, my cell number, and I gave it to him. And he took it. And I was praying all week that he would call me. He didn't call me. But my prayer is that someone through the course of this week, some brother or sister in Christ, while he was on the construction site, continued to share the gospel with him, continued to love on him, and did not point out his failures and his flaws. How many of you love those people that point out your failures and your flaws? I'm going to get into that in just a moment. But if you don't mind, can we do this this morning? Let's, let's look at a couple of key verses that I think are very important. Key verses found, in, and they're up on the screen for you, but I'm going to encourage you to follow me this morning. I've got several scripture that go with this message. And I want you to know this morning, the tone has already been set with the song that was sung. There is one positive to all of what I'm about to share with you, and that's that Jesus can be your stronghold. That's in a positive way. If Jesus is, in, is your stronghold, then you can be victorious with any other stronghold that the devil lies to you about. Are you listening to me, church? So let's go to Psalm chapter 9, verse 9 through 10. It's up on the screen. Again, follow along, highlight. It says, the Lord also will be a stronghold for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. And those who know your name will put their trust in you. For you, O Lord, have forsaken those for you, O Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. I guess my question this morning as I prayed a moment ago, does the Lord know your name? Of course he knows who you are because you're God's creation. But the reality is this, have you ever accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? That's key. That's number one. The very, the very chain that must be broken first is the chain of sin that's brought about when you were born. There's nothing you can do about it. We were born into a sinful nature. But the reality is this, that Jesus Christ went to the cross for you. And that's the chain right now that needs to be broken. If there's nothing else that you hear what I say this morning, if there's nothing else that permeates your heart, I pray that this morning you will not leave this place without knowing Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. And then we go on in Psalm chapter 18, verse 2, it says, The Lord is my rock. And as my Lord and Savior, I want you to know He is the firm foundation in which I can base everything in life on. Amen, church? He's my rock. My house is built on a solid rock, not on shifting sand. In Psalm chapter 18, 2, it says, The Lord is my rock, and He is my what, church? Fortress. Fortress. He is my what? Deliverer. Some of you this morning need to be delivered from a stronghold that's in your life this morning. I don't know what it is. I don't know what's going on in your life. There's a uh, we probably got about 300 plus folks, not only, with he, not only here, but also at the cinema and tuned in with us online. And I pray that this morning you allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you. So what is that stronghold? What is it you need to be delivered from? He's my God. He is my strength in whom I trust. How many of you need strength this morning? How many of you you know what? I just, I just want to make it through today. I just prayed with a, a gentleman a moment ago who found out he's got cancer. Some of you say, I just need some strength right now, Lord. My strength, in whom what I will trust. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, Trust the Lord with all your heart, lean not in your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will direct your path. Some of you need to realize that you just need to trust in Him. How many of you are trusting in everything else? Marty, I'm trusting in the government. They're going to get me through this. You see me after the service. We'll pray, all right? 
you pray for the government, right? The Word of God commands us to pray for our leaders. But I'm here to tell you, if you're trusting in the government, and by the way, listen, I'm going to share something with you. If you're trusting in me, you're trusting in the wrong person. I tell folks every time when I meet with them, when they come and to unite with Fellowship of the Hills, I tell them this is part of my little, not, not speech, but it's part of what I share. I am not perfect. It took me a long time to recognize that. A long time. I'm not perfect. In fact, there are some of you that remind me of that sometimes. Tell me what I need to change in my life. I'm going to get into that in just a moment. But the reality is this. We are not perfect. You're a pastor. There is no pastor that's perfect. Amen? No elder, no deacon, no minister of music, minister of youth. We're not perfect. Every now and then, we fail. I know it. It's tough. We have flaws. We have imperfections. So listen, I'm going to do my best to live a Christ-like life. And as Paul said in Romans 12, 1 and 2, I'm going to do my best and strive to live a righteous and a holy life. But if you see me fail, don't put your faith in me. Put your faith in the chain breaker. Put your faith in the one who can change your life. Put your faith in the one who is perfect, and he will never fail you. He is my shield, the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. In Psalm chapter 27, verse 1, it says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Isn't that true? If we trust in the Lord, whom sh who, who shall we fear? What, 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 what could ever happen here on the face of this planet that I would fear anything if I realized that I serve the one that created this big blue marble? Think about that just for a moment. He holds the stars and the moon in place. Why should I fail anything? When I serve someone who has that kind of power and authority. The Lord is the light of my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is my strength of life. Whom shall I be afraid of? Whom shall I be afraid of? Well, those are the three key verses in this message this morning. We're going to go in several places. But if you have an opportunity, please jot those down and go back and refer to those and memorize those the course of this week. So what is a stronghold? A stronghold is simply defined as this, if you want to follow along. A stronghold is defined as a place that has been fortified so as to protect it against attack. That's a positive thing. A place where a particular cause or belief is strongly defended or upheld. Strongholds can be designed to be a safe place. They can be positive or they can be negative. The verses I just read you are positive. When our stronghold is in God, when we allow Him to be the stronghold of our life, that is a positive. He can defeat anything that we're facing. But we also know that there are strongholds that can be negative. Amen, church? And when many of us think of strongholds, we think of the negative. But I wanted to start off with the positive first. I want you to understand that, that our Lord can be your stronghold to defeat any of the strongholds in your life. So now here's where we get to that. These strongholds come from the lies of the devil. You all know that, right? In fact, John 10.10, 10, we're going to go to that and spend a little bit of time on that in a little bit. In a little bit. But I want to just bring it up to the forefront. John 10.10, 10, it says, the devil comes to steal to kill and destroy. He comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. Can I just ask you a question? How many of you would agree with me that strongholds, the, the lies of the devil, are those things that can steal, kill, and destroy your life? Some of you are allowing the devil this morning to feed you with a lie, with a stronghold that's in your life, and you know what it's stealing from you? Stealing joy. I've got some folks that I know for a fact not only within this worship center and at the cinema, those online, family members as well, they have a hard time living a life of joy. You know why? Because there's a stronghold that they have in their life. I don't know what the stronghold may be. I've, I've got a list, of, and these, these are just a few examples, and I don't know if you can see them all on the screen. The, the printing's kind of small, but I think we put the generic part of this in your bulletin. And I want you to look at these just for a moment. Just kind of make a note off to the side, because I'm going to get personal with you. Is it okay if I get personal with you? You all said yes. You'd die if I walked up with a microphone and say, okay, <laughs> tell us what your stronghold is. So be careful when you say yes. But I'm going to get personal with you, and, but I'm not going to come around with a microphone and ask you a specific question. When I get personal with you, I would never ask you to get personal if I'm not going to get personal myself. I'm going to share some of my strongholds this morning that each and every day I have to go to the Lord like the Apostle Paul and say, Lord, I am fighting the flesh this morning. I need your help. 
I need you to help me with this stronghold. I need this defeated in my life. Do you all do that every morning when you wake up? Say, Lord, I'm facing this this morning. I need you to deal with it. See, I know what my strongholds are. Here's the question. Do you know what yours are? You will if you'll be honest. So here's a few of them right here. Let's just take the big topics. I'm not going to get into the little stuff here, but you kind of get an idea what they are. Some of you may be uh, struggling with bitterness. You, you've got resentment, maybe some family member. You've got, a, uh, uh, you've got those that uh, you've been unforgiving to. You're holding a- anger or, or some kind of malice against them. Uh, maybe there's this heaviness. I can't tell you how many brothers and sisters in Christ, listen, brothers and sisters in Christ who are dealing with heaviness, depression, if, if the Lord is truly our chain breaker, then why would we be depressed? Right? You say, well, Marty, you just don't know what's going on in my life. Some of you are dealing with self-pity. I'm going to come back to that one. In a Insecurity. Insecurity. You, you feel inferior to others, or you feel inadequate. You know? Maybe you're withdrawn or you're shy. Maybe there's a control situation. You like to manipulate others. You like to tell them what you think they should do. Maybe you worry about everything. You're insensitive to others' needs. Maybe you're jealous. Boy, if I only had that truck, if I only had that house, if I only had that shirt or that dress or that jewelry. Maybe there's idolatry. Maybe there are things that you, you, you love the Lord, but, but you've got other things that you worship. Oh, yeah, you put him, put him first on a Sunday, but every other day during the course of the week, you don't really know where he is except on the shelf when you need him. Maybe there's rebellion. Maybe you're dealing with some stubbornness in your life and also anger falls into this category. Maybe it's pride. After all, that's what Lucifer did, right? Lucifer decided he wanted to be just like God. Pride. Self-righteous. Boy, some of us are pharisaical. You know what that term means, right? I'll talk about that in a little bit. Some of us think we're so holy that no one will ever measure up to us. Sadly, that exists in some of our churches today, where folks think that they're better than someone else because of how they live their life. So much so that they press, press that against others. Maybe it's sexual immaturity or impurity. Boy, we've got a lot of that going on in our nation today, right? I, 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 it, boy, I, I, I could really get into this topic here. One of the things that I just want to caution our parents to or with. What a great concern. I was watching something this week and I, I, I was, man, it was, I was beside myself. I, I didn't know a five-year-old had to figure out what they were. And then a parent would help them be something that they're not. And then later on in life, after they have the surgery, they regret it because they didn't have a parent that told them what they were. Amen? Do you all know where I'm coming from on this? Wow. When did we get to a moment like this? Uh, By the way, I just want to share with you here at Fellowship of the Hills, we don't have different pronouns. We have the pronouns that are used in the Word of God. There's he and she. Amen? I'm just saying, you know, that's what the Word of God says. So don't blame me. Don't blame the messenger because if I didn't tell you the truth, the truth wouldn't set you free. Amen? And if you don't hear the truth, then you're bound by this other chain. So, my goodness, sexual impurity. I mean, anything from lust to fornication, adultery. And we could go on and on and on. You know, we, they, they say in the church, did you know this? I, I just want to get this out. I have a men's Bible study every Wednesday. And we've talked about this topic. You know what men are dealing with today? I, you're going to think, you're going to say, Marty, you're crazy. 70%, listen to me now. Now, I'm not listening. I'm closing my eyes. I'm not going to be looking at any men this morning because they'll duck their head when I say this. You know, 70% of the men in church are still dabbling in pornography. You know that? You know that? Boy, I tell you what, it's no longer going to the 7-Eleven and picking up a magazine, putting it in a paper bag and going out. You have access to this thing on your phone, on your iPad. Guys, I'm going to just give you a real, it's not a secret. I'm just going to throw this out to you. If you want to help break the change of pornography, you give your wife all the access to your computer and your cell phone with all of your passwords. So whenever she picks it up, she knows what you're looking at. Amen? And men, you do the same thing. If you're worried about what's going on in your home, you, you all share each other's passwords. Well, I don't want her looking at my phone. Why? You got something to hide? I don't have anything to hide. Susie's got the passwords, everything I got. Amen? 
We have, a, we have a joint bank account, too. What I have, she has. That's hers, and that's, we share it. I don't have my own little till. That's another, another message. I know, I know, I know. I never understood that. Rejection. Maybe some of you are dealing with rejection, and, and you're, you've, you've got an addiction to take care of the rejection that you have. Deceit. Some of you wouldn't know what the truth was if it hit you in the face. You should run for politics. Amen? <laughs> Deceit. Lie, you know, you know we, we have people that tell a lie, and they believe the lie they tell. And, and you got the evidence right there in front of you. Oh, fantasies, delusions, or even the wrong doctrine. Some folks will come and tell me what the Word of God says, and I look at them like, oh, you know what? you got to show it to me. So, in fact, some folks come up and say, you know, Marty, that's a sin. I say, oh, time out. You show me where it's a sin. Well, I can't show you. That's just what I've been told. I don't care what you've been told. If you can't show me in this book, then don't come preaching to me. Amen? Amen. I just want to just throw that out, too. I get some of that sometimes. Fear. Man, I'll tell you what, where are you at, Jason? It's amazing when the Lord breaks the chain of fear and you're up here singing and doing all the things that the Lord's called you to do. Isn't it amazing? And how he works. So I, I said I was going to get personal. I, I'm just going to tell you a, a couple of my hang-ups. And you pray for me because I'm going to pray for you. So, so, so sometimes, I know it's kind of hard to believe, but, but it's kind of rooted with, in my childhood. Uh, I was kind of a, I wouldn't say a loner, but I have insecurity issues. And you say, that's impossible. No, really, I do. And the Lord has broken that chain. But there are times I get up in the morning and I have to say, Lord, help me with this. I want to be outgoing. I don't, you know what ins insecurity is, right? It's when you feel you're not good enough. Now, what came out of that insecurity, here's the other, my other flaw. I'm going to just bear it all to you this morning. I'm a perfectionist. Have, have any of you figured that out yet? Some of you, oh my goodness, if you only knew Marty. I am a perfectionist. That was a little bit of what happened last Saturday. I want everything to be just right. Susan will come home tomorrow to a perfectly clean house. She'll come home to the dogs washed. She'll come home with flowers and a little welcome balloon. I, I just spoiled it. Oh, man. <laughs> Honey, you're, you're watching online. I should have figured that one out. But anyway, but, but she knows that. She knows what a perfectionist her husband is. And you know what? Being a perfectionist is not good. Did you know that? It's part of that insecurity. Because I will never measure up to my own standards. And let me tell you something else. If I'm not careful, you'll never measure up to my standards. Did you know that? And so I have to be very careful because sometimes I can be so demanding of myself that I'm that demanding on others. And when they don't fulfill the mission as to the way I thought they would fulfill it, here's one of two things that happen. I'll either do it myself so it gets done right. Anybody ever done that? And when you do that, that person doesn't learn how to do it right, do they? Don't we do that with our kids? Or we expect something of them that we, what? We press them down. So they say, well, if I can't ever be good enough, then I'm not going to be. Amen? And that sometimes happens. And you know what? Sometimes that happens even with a pastor. You know, pastors are really bad about judging themselves based upon the success of how many seats are full in the worship center. And I had to get over that a long time ago. Amen, church? And we, and we learned a little bit of that yesterday in our prayer team. You know, the Lord may send us out there for 10 or maybe at when, we're, when we did the camp fault this past week, we may put all this effort into something. And we may have it all laid out. We want it perfect. Every craft, everything that we want to do. And then only one, maybe five people come. And if that's the case, then we need to put everything into it for that one or that five that come. Amen? Jesus, it says that Jesus was so pressed there at the Sea of Galilee that he asked Peter to borrow his boat. So he could get out and preach to the crowds that were on the seashore. It says they were, you know what that means when it says they were pressed against him? It means there were so many people there who couldn't even move. That was the crowds that came to hear Jesus. Yet Jesus made, took a route that he wasn't supposed to take and met the woman at the well just to take time with her. So sometimes we ourselves, if we're not careful, we base our success on numbers. Are you with me? That's part of that insecurity, part of that perfection that we strive for. Now, I'm going to show you something here. Here's what I found out. Did you know we're all the same? Did you know we all have flaws? Amen? We all have flaws. I, you know, it's, it's kind of interesting, and, and I've, I've probably shared this with you before, and some of you did it this morning. Um, we look in the mirror, and we realize we're getting older. Amen? Yeah. 
or, or uh, I was walking in the, in the uh, fellowship hall this morning, and John said, you're limping a little bit. I said, well, I just got up from sitting at my desk, and it takes a little while for, the, for all the oil to start lubricating the bones. Y'all know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah. Uh, we go to the gym, right, Brian? And, and we can't do what we used to do. We try it, and then we realize we should never do that again. Amen? <laughs> right? Right. We, as we get old, the flaws became, become more pronounced. Amen? But you know what I found out about people? You know what I found out about us? There's one thing that every one of us needs. And every one of us use it. <laughs> Amen? Am I wrong? So when you start thinking you're less than anybody else, and that person starts telling you you're no good, you're never going to measure up, you say, you use the same thing I do. <laughs> Amen? Am I wrong or right? Yeah. Yeah. So, if nothing else, you guys will remember that this morning, right? <laughs> so those are some examples of the strongholds. I, sh I shared with you a couple of mine. Even sometimes seeking acceptance. And I have to be careful with that one too. I pray about that every day. Lord, I, 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 wanted, I want people to like me. Is there anybody in here that doesn't want somebody to like them? I didn't think so. Every one of us wants somebody to like us. You never want to disappoint anybody. You know what's happened? Some, what's, what's wrong? Sometimes, again, I'm just burying my soul with you because strongholds that you pray for me as I pray for you. Every day I pray for this. Lord, don't let me be the pastor that's about preaching to make people like me. Lord, don't let me deliver a message that makes them like me. Lord, let me deliver your word even when it hurts, even when it speaks to their heart, even when it speaks to my heart. Lord, I need that conviction as well. I need to change as well. Sometimes, not often, but sometimes, I'll get that call and they said, hey, how'd you know what was going on in my life? I didn't, but you can share it with me. Amen? Or, Pastor, I, I didn't really appreciate what you said. You know, hey, hey, listen, and I tell people this, this is part of my little speech when, when folks come unite with the church. I, I tell them I'm not perfect. And then I say, oh, oh, by the way, sometimes on a Sunday morning, if you see me walking in the back of the church, and I walk right by you, and I make eye contact with you, but I don't say hi to you, it's not because I'm ignoring you, but the Holy Spirit has me in a place. And, and to be honest with you, I just don't see anything. There are sometimes I'll walk that back room and get back in there to pray, and I don't realize I've even walked in there. Do you understand what I'm saying? The Lord has me right. So, but I've had people come to me, Pastor, why are you mad at me? I'm not mad at you. Why do you think I'm mad at you? Well, you know, you walked right by me Sunday morning, and you didn't say a word. I can't believe you did that. And then I have to apologize for something I didn't mean I did. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I say, Lord, I, I, I don't, I want to serve you. I want the folks to love me. But Lord, you're number one in my life. And sometimes people aren't going to like me. You know, there, there are people been let, have left this church because they don't like me. And that's okay. They didn't like maybe the message that was preached. Maybe they didn't like my attitude about it. I don't know what it is, but I, you, folks, I have flaws. And I'm not perfect. Will you accept that from your pastor? I'm not perfect? Yeah, absolutely. But the bottom line is, I know he's still working on me to make me what I ought to be. Amen. So let's get into this this morning. So I said all that to say this, and I want you to pray about it, think about it. We're going to come to that time at the end of the service. What strongholds are controlling you? What strongholds are controlling you? So many of us right now feel like we're in the darkness. So many of us feel as though there, there's just no way to live up to someone else's standards Nevertheless, to live up to God's standards. So for many, they quit, they give up, they become discouraged. What I want to share with you this morning, whatever stronghold that you're facing, whatever that list was, and that list is much greater than what I shared with you. It's just a few examples. And I was personal with you about mine. And the Apostle Paul said that I do fight with the flesh every day. But every day I realize that if I turn it over to the Lord, I can be victorious in those things. Amen, church? Some of you this morning have this little box within your heart or within your mind. Maybe some of those things this morning as we read them on the screen, as we were just talking a little bit about them. Some of you, man, the Holy Spirit brought that to your mind, say, you need to get rid of that. That's a lie from the devil, and I can defeat that. I can get that out of your life. You just need to call on me.
John chapter 10, 10. And also look at verse 11. It says, the thief comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. But what did Jesus say? Jesus said, I came to give you life. And so many times we stop there. Jesus didn't come just to give us life. In other words, the salvation from our sin. But he also came to give us an abundant life. And that abundant life is the fruit of the Spirit. And part of that fruit of the Spirit is his what? His love, his joy, his peace, his long-suffering, right? And if I was to probably say, hey, what's the number one thing you want in life? Probably in these two categories, number one and number two. Some of you might say, well, love is number one. Some of you might say, well, I want joy. That's number one. And love may be number two. But I will guarantee you right in those top two, love and joy come together. Because every one of us want to feel loved. And every one of us want to have a joy in life. And then the others may come in, in certain areas within that lineup. We want to have peace, you know. But the reality is this, that, that Jesus says, I came to give you life, eternal life, a, forgiving, a, a life that's been forgiven by what I did on the cross for you. But I also came to give you an abundant life, a life that's filled with the fruit of the Spirit. And notice as we go on, he says, Jesus says that I am the good shepherd. You know what is so good about a good shepherd? He takes care of his sheep. He takes care of his flock. Amen? Now listen, I am very thankful that the Lord allows me to be one of his under shepherd. So many times pastors are called the shepherd. We need to fix that right now. It's like those people that put Jesus as my co-pilot on the front of their car. You need to get that tag off your car if you've got it. I'm not going to go out and look at the parking lot today. I'm just going to tell you, okay? But you know that's not true. If Jesus is your co-pilot, I ain't riding with you. You know why? Because I want Jesus to be your pilot. He needs to be the one that's driving the car, flying the wheel, leading your life. Amen? So he's not my co-pilot. He's my pilot. Amen, church? So as we think about that this morning, we need to realize that we need to allow him to be in the control of our life. As a good shepherd, which I am not your shepherd. He said, well, every pastor is called a shepherd. No, I'm an under-shepherd. I'm the one that works for the shepherd. Actually, I don't work for him. I serve him. Amen? And I'm held responsible to him. But I'm your under-shepherd to bring you what the shepherd wants you to hear. See, as a good shepherd, he also disciplines us too, right? You know, every now and then the sheep's get, sheep get outside the, the gate, right? And the shepherd will go out and get the sheep. Now, if the sheep continues to do that, you know what a shepherd would do? Do you all know what he does? He would actually break the leg and mend it of that sheep. And then he would stay close to that sheep until that leg was mended. In other words, we talked about this a few weeks ago. The Lord disciplines the ones that he loves. And the shepherd will take care of his sheep to keep them within the fold, to keep them in the flock. So he loves me that much because he's my good shepherd. The shepherd also will lay down his life for the sheep. If that shepherd sees a lion or a wolf or something out there to get a sheep, you know what the shepherd's going to do? Send the rest of the sheep, take care of it. No, he doesn't. You know what the shepherd does? He goes after and he fights the battle for the sheep. How many of you are so thankful that the Lord fights my battles? Amen? That's what this message is about. You see, we hold on to these strongholds in life because we feel as if there's no way out. And there is a way out. You can be victorious in Jesus Christ. How do I know that? Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 6. 2, 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 6. It says, for though we walk in the flesh. We walk in the flesh, right, church? Yes or no? How many of you, I just need to see, where are you perfect people that have no flaws, no imperfections? Where are you at? I need to meet you. There's none in here. In fact, we know because the Word of God says there's none righteous, no, not one. The Word of God says we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Amen, church? So when we understand that, we realize that, that we're around a bunch of imperfect people. There's only one that was perfect, and His name was Jesus Christ. And He went to the cross for you and for me. But we walk in the flesh. Notice what Paul says, for, for we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. What does that mean? That means the very things that are the strongholds in our life, the, the way that we would like to fight that battle, we can't fight it. Oh, some do. 
Uh, some will turn to various addictions to try to fight a battle that they can't fight. They just say, I'm going to give up. So what I'm going to do is drown myself in this so I'll forget about it. Or at this moment, it'll ease the pain. Y'all understand what I'm talking about? Whether it be drugs or alcohol, whatever. I, if I can just drown it, I won't think about it at this moment. It won't be there. But the reality is when you come out of that, it's still there. Amen? So we try to fight things within what we think is the fleshly war that we think a battle can be fought. But God says that that's not how it works. And notice what he says here. He says that we try to wage war according to the flesh. Number four, verse number four, it says, for the weapons of our warfare are what, church? Are not of the flesh. How many of you say, well, that's good to know. I needed to know that. Yeah. Isn't that true, church? I need to understand that I can't fight the strongholds in my life the way I would normally fight a battle right? In order for me to fight the strongholds in my life, I need to turn to the only one who can make me victorious in those strongholds. Amen? Amen. So let me just pause right here. If you want to defeat the strongholds in your life, you need to let go and let God have it. You need to let him have it. You've been fighting it for so long. Why not this morning you be honest with yourself and say, you know what? I'm dealing with something right here. Some some people know about it. Some people don't know about it. And say, I'm going to let this go this morning. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh. Now I underline this, I've got it in bold print. But divinely powerful for the destruction of fortress. What? Divinely powerful. Where does that come from? It comes from God. We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against what? Up against the knowledge of God. Well, if it's raised up against the knowledge of God, what do I need to know first? I need to know the knowledge of God. I need to know His truth. Amen, church? So many folks have told you that you're defeated. So many folks have told you you're no good. So many folks have told you that you'll never get through this. But that's a lie because God said you can. That's what His truth says. You can be an overcomer if you'll serve the chain breaker and let the chain breaker have it. We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. And we are taking every thought captive to the what? Obedience of Christ. And we are ready to punish all disobedience whenever your, whenever your obedience is made complete. Well, that's kind of interesting because that's going to take me to a couple of other verses. You're not going to have them in there. But I, I, I just I thought about this this morning as I was sitting in my office. And, I, and, and the Lord brought me to Matthew chapter 7. And we need to be careful with this. It's difficult enough to fight the battles and the strongholds in our life without having someone tell us we need to meet, we need to meet their expectations of how holy and righteous I am. Amen, church? How many of you have met them? Just want you to know the Lord has showed me the way to tell you how sorry you are. <laughs> right? Hey, listen, when you reach perfection, listen, I want you to help be my accountability partner. But I don't need you to tell me how holy and righteous you are. If you see a flaw in my life, you come help me through it. Don't come and tell me how perfect you are. And you know what? Jesus had a way of reminding us of that in Matthew chapter 7. Listen to this. What did he say? Who knows? It says, do not judge so what? That you will not be judged. For in the way... You judge, you will be judged. And by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. How many of you want to have everyone meet your standard? You know what I found out about people that want me to meet their standards? They're not even meeting their standards. Amen? It would be wrong for me to stand up here and tell you something that is not written in the Word of God. I remember as a young boy, pastors would get up, and I was so conflicted by it. And they would come up with all those things that you should and shouldn't do until I got old enough to get into the Word of God and realize they were pushing their standards on the church rather than God's standards. Does that make sense, church? Amen. Someone asked me the other day, he says, well, what do I wear to church? I said, clothes. <laughs> Well, do I need to wear a tie? Do I need to wear a suit? You know, there was, a, listen to me, there was a time where I thought you had to wear a coat and tie to church. Did you know there was a time I thought you had to wear a dress? Well, I didn't wear one, but, but you know what I'm saying, you know, <laughs> right? Well, really? And that was just a, a, a burden that was pressed upon people. Amen? Standards. If we're not careful, we want others to live our standards when the reality is we're not living our own standard. 
well, I don't want you to talk like that around me. And then all of a sudden you see them at Walmart, and they're just kind of going off, you know. Or you ride with them in the car, and all of a sudden somebody cuts them off in traffic. Woo, never heard that before, you know. <laughs> Verse number three says, why do, you, why do you look at the speck that is in your brother's eye, and you don't notice the log that's in your own eye? In your own eye. <laughs> I'm going to be really careful what I say here. I, listen, I am not at my perfect weight. Newsflash. I feel comfortable where I'm at. The last three weeks, I have done really good. Man, if you only knew how bad I wanted to stay, I said, you know what, for three weeks, I'm going to lay off of any red meat. If you knew how much I love hamburgers and steaks. So for the last three weeks, I have been eating chicken and fish. The other night, I went to a restaurant, and they had a prime rib special. And I said, no, I'm not going to do it. I want to do it, but I'm not going to do it. It's a stronghold. <laughs> so, so I ordered blackened fish. And it was good. But the first three or four bites, the couple across from me got the prime rib special. And I am looking at that prime rib special and eating my blackened fish and thinking, Lord, please help me with this stronghold right now. <laughs> so here's what I'm saying. So, so a couple of weeks ago, you know, I, I go to my cardiologist, and, and, and we're talking, you know, kind of monitoring some things. And uh, she says, well, you're doing pretty good on your weight, but, you know, you could probably you lose a few more pounds. So that was one of the reasons, you know, I, I did this, maybe hitting hard in the gym. But I'm going to be careful. But she herself could lose a little weight. <laughs> do you understand what I'm saying? She's my doctor, and she's telling me what to do. How many of you have ever felt funny like that? I, it almost came out of my mouth. I said, Lord, thank you for holding my tongue. Amen? But I mean, you, know, you know what I'm saying? If we're not careful, we hold others to those. And, and what happens is, so, so I, I, I go home and I'm thinking, I've been doing pretty good. I've lost some weight. feeling pretty good about myself. And she tells me I need to lose more weight. I don't want to lose more weight. I feel good where I'm at, you know? I'm happy here, you know? And then the whole time I'm, I'm muttering to myself, well, she needs this one. You know? <laughs> and that verse came to mind. I need to write that and send it to her without my name on it. Get the moat out of your own eye. For you, know, you, don't, you don't understand what I'm saying. So what happened is, when I left there, the burden of what she said became pressed on me. Are you with me, church? Sometimes we can bring a burden, a stronghold on someone else because of the standard or expectation we have on them. In other words, they're fighting their battles. And then all of a sudden, we're pressing them with something. Does that make sense? Instead of encouraging them. You know what would have been really sweet? If she just said, you know what? I'm like you. I need to lose a, lose a little bit. Why don't we do this together? I said, yeah, that's my kind of doctor. Right? I mean, right? Wouldn't that feel good if someone said, hey, listen, I know you're struggling with something. I'm struggling with this. Let's do this together. Let's pray about this together. Amen, church? I want that kind of accountability partner, and I'm praying for that with our men. Listen, I, I, I want to be that one that I want to lead by example, right? But I don't want to press my standards on you. It's difficult enough for me to meet my own standards. I don't know what the, what the Holy Spirit's speaking to you this morning, but I know for many of us, we feel as though we fall short. We miss the mark, and when that happens, we live in guilt. Are you with me, church? We get discouraged, we feel that we, we have failed, and we live, this, live with this defeatist attitude. Don't give up. Don't give in. Don't quit. That's not what God would have you to do. In fact, we don't have time to go through everything this morning, just in this one alone. But I began to think of Matthew eleven thirty. 30. The Lord gave me that this morning. It's part of my notes. And in that it says, Jesus says that my yoke is easy and my burden's light. In other words, Jesus says, I want to take all of that garbage, all of those strongholds, give that to me. Because my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I truly believe that when Jesus says that he's not only our what? Our life, but when he said he's our abundant life, he wants us to live a victorious life. 
And to live a victorious life is letting go of the strongholds in our life. Those things that are discouraging us. Those standards. Listen, folks, I am never going to be perfect. And if I try to be perfect every day, I am going to be so frustrated. I'm going to feel so guilty that I have failed. And you know what? It took me a long time to realize that I am not perfect. And I will never attain the perfection that I demand of myself. And you know what? Jesus doesn't expect that perfection because he knows that every day I fight the flesh. And he knows I need him to get me through that day. If I depend on myself, I have failed. Listen, if I depend on me, I failed him because I want him to be in control of my life. I want him to know that I trust in him to get me through this. Amen, church? I want him to know that I can turn it over to you, Lord. I want to walk in the path that you have for me. I don't want to be burdened to realize that I'm not perfect, but your perfection, your righteousness can flow through me. I began to think about that. Jesus went to the cross, right? He was perfect in every way. They nailed him to a cross. Y'all remember when he arose? What was it Thomas wanted to see? Come on, what did Thomas want to see? He wanted to see his hands. He wanted to see the nail prints in his hands. Now let me ask you a question. Have you ever thought about this? Jesus was perfect in every way. Why didn't Jesus come back with a perfected body that had no prints, no scars in his hand and no scar in his side? Why didn't Jesus do that? You ever thought about that? Because he wanted to see that he took our imperfection and paid for every bit of it. He wanted to see that it was real. Those scars are real. I paid that price for you. I took your scars. I took them. My yoke is easy. My burden is light because I took all of the strongholds and I've defeated them for you. So why are you carrying them around? Why are you letting them mess with your mind and your head? Turn it over to me because I already paid for it. See? Look. Write this down. Anything that we trust in besides God is a spiritual stronghold. Anything that you trust in besides God is your spiritual stronghold. Whatever it is, whatever you're dealing with today, that has become your spiritual stronghold. I got to move on here. Number two, trust in God to break your chains. Trust in God to break the chains of your strongholds. Proverbs 21, 22. Listen, I love this verse. Many of you have not seen this verse. It says, a wise man scales the city of the mighty and brings down the stronghold in which they trust. A wise man. How many of you are wise in the Lord this morning? You see, if you're wise in the Lord, you will realize that God can bring down the walls of the stronghold in your life and defeat those enemies. Why don't you turn it over to him this morning? Psalm 94, 22. But the Lord has been my stronghold and my God, the rock of my refuge. Psalm 144, 1 through 2 says, Blessed is the Lord. He is my rock who trains my hands for war and my fingers for battle, my loving kindness and my fortress, my stronghold, my deliverer, my shield. And he in whom I take refuge, he subdues my people under me. A great verse of the psalmist. Instead of depending upon ourselves and being in the bondage that we have placed ourselves on by the very strongholds within our life, whatever they are, we realize that God can be the rock, the firm foundation on which we can stand. We realize that God can train us by the renewing, what did Paul say? By the renewing of our mind. God can break the chain holds, those strongholds, those chains, and we can live victorious in Christ. We can have that abundant life, that joy, that peace, that comfort. But you see, you'll never be released of those strongholds or those chains until you're willing to turn them over to Him. After all, that's what the message is about this morning. What is it? What is it that the Holy Spirit has brought to your mind and say, you know what? 
as the pastor was sharing some of those things that daily he prays for the victory in those things in his life. These are things that I'm facing. And these are victories I need. And in order for me to have those victories, I need to turn those strongholds over to the Lord. I love what the psalmist said here in chapter 40, verse 1 and 2. These are actually my life verses. He says, I waited patiently for the Lord. And he inclined to me and he heard my cry. I just want to pause here for a moment. The Lord is waiting patiently for you to say, God, I've had enough. I can't deal with this anymore. I am in this pit right now. This is a stronghold. This is a battle that I've been trying to fight. I can't fight it with my flesh. And God's saying, I know. I've already paid for that. I've already taken care of it. Give it to me. Let me have it. And I'll take it out of your life. But you got to let it go. you got to let me have it. The psalmist says, he inclined unto me and he heard my cry. Now, there's so much more I could tell you about myself, but today's not the day for that. I've already shared a few things with you, but I'm here to tell you he heard my cry. He brought me up out of the horrible pit. He brought me up out of the horrible pit of destruction and out of that miry clay, and he set my feet on a rock, and he made my footsteps firm. And if you go on in that passage, it says that all who would see would fear not fear God for how powerful he was, but to fear God for how much love that he has for us that he can scoop down and pull us out of the pit and he can set us on a firm foundation. But you know what? He won't do that unless you're willing to reach up and let him have your hand. Because if you don't reach up and say, Lord, I, I can't do this. I need to let go. I need to take your hand to get me out of this and put me on some solid footing here. If we're not willing to do that, guess what? We stay in the pit. Now, if I was to ask in this room, okay, <clears throat> how many of you want to stay in the pit? Nobody wants to stay in the pit. Some of you in this room say, man, Marty, I, if you only knew I'm in despair, I'm discouraged, I feel defeated. In fact, I've even heard that in my life, so I'm just going to keep doing what I'm doing. Maybe some know, maybe some don't know. Maybe some have reminded you and told you that, number one, you don't meet their standards, and then you just say, well, if I can't meet theirs, if I can't meet God's, I'm just going to give up. I'm just going to kind of go through the motions of life. I don't know about you, but I want to be victorious in Jesus Christ. I want to let him have the chains that have had me bound. Let him have the strongholds. Oh, I love what the Apostle Paul says here. Philippians chapter 4, verses 10 through 13. Notice how he starts off. It says, but I rejoiced in the Lord greatly. You know, so many times we're so worried about all the strongholds that we have that we don't realize all the good things that we have. Amen, church? How blessed we are, you know? Boy, I tell you what, and I know she's listening. I've already told her what I'm going to do. I have missed my bride for three weeks. I'm going to tell you what, we, we went down there for two weeks, spent some time. We brought the grandson back. He was with us almost three weeks. Susan's been gone three weeks. I'm going to tell you what, for two months, I have been in a fog. <laughs> I'm telling you, taking care of the house, taking care of the dogs. The dogs, I'm going to tell you what, honey, you know I've been cooking for them. They are so spoiled right now. I mean, they've been my friends at the house, you know. And some wonderful and gracious people have, have had me over for some meals, you know. Those have been the nights that I ate too much. But I'm going to tell you what, when your wife is not with you, you miss her. Not because of the things that she does. I just miss, and she knows this, I just, she's my best friend. I got a lot of friends, but she's my best friend. I enjoy spending time with her. Amen? So many times we take things for granted until they're gone. Amen? So I love what Paul says. He says, but I rejoice in the Lord greatly. So many times I don't think we realize what we have in our relationship with God the Father. He is right there. He loves me just like any dad. And he says, why are you walking around with all this weight? Why are you walking around with these chains on? Why are you walking around feeling discouraged and defeated? Let me have it. Let it go. Give it to me. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at the last you have revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned before. 
but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak from want, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstance I'm in. Buddy, let me tell you what, for the last week I have learned how to be content in my circumstances. Amen? Yeah. I learned how to take care of the dogs by myself. Praise the Lord. I know how to clean the house. You get a blower out there and open up the windows, you can get all the dust out of the house. I know how to make the bed. I know how to wash my clothes. Now, I didn't iron them. I'm going to be honest with you. I don't like to iron. So I just threw them in a bag and took them to the cleaners. I said, do you guys iron these? I know how to take care of the house. I know how to cut the grass. Paul says, I know whatever circumstance I am, I'm in to be content. So if I know whatever circumstance I am to be content, then that means I can let the Lord have all the rest of it. He can take care of it. Lord, if this is where you want me to be, I'm going to trust in you. Lord, I'm not going to let these things be my hang-ups. I'm not going to let these things be the chains that bind me. Because, Lord, I am walking with you. I'm trusting you. I'm not going to let these things have control of me. Verse number 12, he says, I, I know how to get along with humble means. And I also know how to live in prosperity. And in every circumstance I have learned, notice what he says, the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering. He says, I've learned this. You know what the secret is? Trusting God. Trusting God in everything. But again, many of us trust on those strongholds. We let them, they, they, they keep us prisoner. This verse is so important to me, and it's an indelible mark on me. Paul said, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Well, you know what, folks? If, if I truly believe that, if I believe I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength, then why do I let other things control me? Why do I let other things chain me down? Why do I let people and their standards hold me in chains and bondage? If I truly believe that I can do all things in Christ who gives me strength, why don't I turn it over to him and let him have it? I want you to pray with me this morning, but before you do, I want you to listen to the Holy Spirit this morning. Some of you are in bondage. And I'm going to tell you what, I don't want you to look at someone else, whether they write something down or don't, because there's not one person in here that's not dealing with some little box in their mind and their heart. And this morning, may this be the day that you break that chain. Listen to me at the cinema, at the house, wherever you're at in this room. You've got a little slip of paper right there. And as I pray, it's okay, because I'm praying for you. But as I pray, pull a pen out and write down whatever it is. You may have one or two or three boxes. Pastor, you just don't understand what's in my closet. Maybe today's the day you need to let it go. Let it go. Because in a moment, as I pray for you, I'm going to have two of our deacons up here with a trash bag. They're going to be at the cinema. And I'm encouraging you, if you're at home, write this down. And what I want you to do, I want you to take that, symbolically, of course. But as you symbolically do this, and you throw it in the trash, you say, today, Lord, I let it go. I am not going to let this be chain. I'm not going to let it be bondage. I'm not going to let it be something that's going to control me, this stronghold. I'm going to let it go. I'm giving it to you. I'm throwing it in the trash. And, Lord, you're going to deal with it in my life. And each and every day, I'm going to pray, Lord, to remove that from my life. And I will promise you, you can be victorious in Jesus Christ. But you've got to be willing to reach up. You've got to be willing to let him go. So as I pray for you, you begin writing those things down. Don't be embarrassed. Don't be bashful. You see, I've, I've got mine right here. I already took care of that before I came out here. I would never ask you to do something that I would not do myself. As an under-shepherd, I want to lead by example. And I pray every day that the Lord continues to remove strongholds and chains of my life. How about you? Father, this message this morning was as much for me as it was for the people in this room. For those that are at the cinema and those that are tuned in with us online. Father, so many of us, if we'll just be honest with ourselves, Father, we have these, sometimes they're hidden, these little hidden boxes, these strongholds. And, and Lord, we don't think anybody knows about it, but Lord, you know, and you say, listen, if you'll just reach up, I can take away that stronghold, that chain that binds you. 
Some father have, have lived in depression for years because of something that might have been said to them in the past. Maybe someone told them, because of who you are or what you've done, you'll never amount to anything. And Lord, today I just want to remind them that they're your masterpiece. Oh, Lord, you want to mold them and make them into an incredible masterpiece that you have for them. This could be the beginning of a new journey in their life. To walk away, to throw away, to put it in the trash, that thing that holds them captive, that holds them prisoner. So many of them, Lord, are believing the lie of the devil. A devil that wants to destroy. A devil that wants to rob them of joy. A devil that wants to hold them in defeat. But Jesus, you're the chain breaker. Jesus, in you I have victory. Jesus, in you I am an overcomer. And so, Father, I pray today that in this room, that, Father, that these in this room, those that are tuned in with us, they'll let you remove the chains. Jesus, you've got the master key to the cuff, the master key that can release the chains. And, Lord, as I close, for that one this morning that's in this room, tuned in with us, that doesn't know you as their Lord and Savior, Father, the very chain of sin that's holding, that's got them bound right now. You went to the cross and you broke those chains. And Father, by faith believing, all they need to do is believe that you are the way of salvation and call on the name of Jesus Christ in faith believing, confessing their sins and say, Jesus, today I make you my Lord and my Savior. The greatest weight can be released and salvation will come. So, Father, I'm going to thank you for what you have done and what you're going to do. In Jesus' name, all God's people said, amen.